Vă spunem bine ați venit. Aș vrea să începem seara. Hanania Naftali este numele invitatului nostru. Am fost foarte surprins în perioada în care așteptam oamenii să vină, să văd că sunt destul de mulți dintre voi care îl cunosc. Uh, îl urmăresc deja, îi urmăresc activitatea, așa că pentru mine a fost o mare și plăcută surpriză. Ei bine, n-am să spunem mai multe despre el, pentru că vrem să-l invităm să uh, se prezinte. Seara se va desfășura în felul următor. O să avem o scurtă, un scurt timp de prezentare cu câteva întrebări legate de viața lui. Apoi, un, uh, apoi o să aibă o prezentare. Iar mai apoi o să vină partea a doua, cu mai multe întrebări care vor veni de la noi și de la voi. Veți primi un link pe Slido la un moment dat și veți putea pune acolo întrebări. Cam asta este seara la care vă chemăm, seara privată pe care am pregătit-o pentru noi. Așteptăm să înțelegem un pic mai mult din ce se întâmplă în lumea asta. Israelul este în război, războiul este unul fizic, dar este și unul spiritual în spate și... Curiozitatea noastră crește să vedem o perspectivă evreiască, dacă vreți, asupra situației actuale și mai ales asupra vremurilor care par să vină și să fie foarte aproape. Așa că haideți să spunem un bun venit lui Hanania. Hanania, please. Thank you. Thanks. Take a seat. Wow, wow. You have it on? It's, uh, you were... It's on? I think it yes, is. Yes, it is on. Okay. Okay. Hey, um, before listening to your presentation, uh, we want to get to know each other. Some people know you better than others. Uh, so we want everybody to learn some things about you before your presentation. So please tell us in few words some things about, uh, introduce yourself, some some personal things about your family, about you? Well, first of all, I have to say it's very exciting for me to be in Romania, to be in Cluj. It's my first time, my first time in Romania. So, um, yeah. And I, I think there is no better place to be than with, you know, amazing people that want to hear about Israel. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. And yeah, so I come to you almost from Israel. I, I was yesterday in Norway. I, I also spoke there about Israel and I, I saw that it's so necessary, especially in this war. So from Norway, I came here, but I, I come from Israel. I was born and raised in Israel, in the Upper Galilee, in Tzfat. And yeah, we live in, in dark times these days. I also have been in the war and I, today I work for Prime Minister Netanyahu since 2018, and I also fight for the truth on social media. Thank you. Now I have a question more, even more personal, if, um, uh, if you would like to explain us uh, a little bit about uh, your spiritual uh, side of your life. Like, um, I saw that you are introducing yourself, presenting yourself as a follower of Jesus. And in some, uh, in some places on the internet, uh, you really emphasize the fact that you are not a Messianic Jew, uh, but a follower of Jesus. Can you explain us a little bit uh, the difference? And um Do we have uh, two hours for free? <laughs> 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 but, wow, I mean, it's... I chose to follow Jesus. It's not something that's very popular in, in Israel. Exactly. We are a very small group of people that believe in Jesus. There are Messianic Jews and there are great people. I, um, you know, as I studied the Bible and I studied um, my faith, because it's, it's very personal at the end of the day. And I learned that with every denomination, there are stereotypes that when they meet you, they, you tell them, I'm Catholic or I'm Baptist. So, so they immediately want to know what do, how are we different and not what do we have in common. 
So I, I decided that it's the best way to do it is to just say, hi, I'm Hanania, I'm Jewish, and I believe in Jesus. If you want to judge me, do this based on how you know me and not based on the titles. So I, I saw that this is the best way to do it. It opens more doors in, because maybe people have a bad experience with um, titles and names. So I, I, I learned that the best way to do it is to just say, I follow Jesus. I have nothing to be ashamed of. If people have a problem with it, they are welcome to have a conversation with me. Um, but I, it, it just reduces the level of, of judgment based on, uh, you know, A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. How did that happen? Uh, in few words, if you can tell us, how did you discover Jesus? So I was... My parents, they immigrated to Israel from uh, former Soviet Union. So we do have that in common that we suffered communism. And as soon as communism collapsed, my parents flew to Israel. Uh, the Jewish agency helped smuggle them via Budapest to Israel. And they were not believers in Jesus. Communism encourages atheism the belief in the, in the individual. So they knew that they were Jewish, and, but they were not practicing it. And when they came to Israel, they practiced Judaism, and they learned that they didn't feel fulfilled, to put it in a short way. So they met someone, long story short, they met someone that they saw so much joy in their face. And they said, we want, we want what you have. And it was Jesus. So they, they became believers in Jesus in Israel. And I was born into this family. So they taught me about the Bible. We would have Bible studies before going to sleep, before bed, bedtime. And, but I myself chose to follow Jesus when I was 14 because... I told, I told you, it's not popular to follow Jesus. It's not popular to uh, be in Israel, be Jewish, and to say I also believe in Jesus. So I, I, I didn't want to, growing up, it wasn't cool. I, and I wanted to be uh, among the cool guys. I wanted to be with, because we all have this desire to be uh, accepted and to be part of something. And so I, I said, you know, to myself, to my parents, when I was a teenager, that you love Jesus, good, this is for you, it's not for me. I will live my own life, and um, yeah, that's, that's what I did. But at the age of 14, I, 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 I felt like it's, it's, it's missing something. Life is missing purpose for me, and so I chose to um, follow, follow Jesus. This, this, is, this is something that... You know, in Israel, we have Jews, Christians, Muslims, Druze, uh, Baha'i. You can be whatever you want to believe in. So um, it's a pluralistic country, and I'm happy that I'm able to believe in what I want without pushing it on, on people, but living my life. And are you accepted? It's, uh, can you blend easily with the, in the society, or are you viewed with suspicion? Declaring yourself a follower of Jesus? Most people have no problem with, with faith. Most people, they believe in God and they, they're not religiously against what you believe in. There, there is a small group that hates me. There is a small group in Israel that, that uh, boycotts me. I, I think that it's ridiculous because we, the Jewish people, we are 0.2% of humanity. Why do we have to have so many arguments between us? So I, I always encourage my, my Jewish friends that it doesn't matter if you're left, if you're right, you, you, you love Trump or you love Biden in the Israeli version, you're my brother, you're my sister, and let's work together. There will be Lots of questions uh, in, uh, in this field <laughs> uh, later. Well, thank you very much. Um, I would like to let you uh, do your presentation. Israel at war, physical and spiritual war. We want to hear 
a little bit of, uh, from, from your, learn from your perspective. And then I'm sure many other questions will come and uh, we'll take it from there. Absolutely. Wow. So I'm looking forward to also getting your questions. I'm sure that it's going to be fun to answer them. I, I always like to say, give me only tough questions, please. Um, <laughs> I, there I, are some. Because in, in Romania, you, you have uh, good food. So after answering tough questions, you want to eat good food. Um, but you know, it's, it's, um, it's funny because in Israel, I always eat Romanian food also. Um, because we have a lot of Jews that come from Romania. So every birthday that a Romanian friend of mine has, we book a table at a Romanian restaurant in Tel Aviv. But the menu of the Romanian uh, dishes is so big that I still didn't go through everything. But you mentioned Mama Liga. Maybe I will try that. I tried Romanian kebab. That was good. But um, I, I have to say, you know, I'm coming to you from a land that is in conflict. So for me to wear jacket to speak with you is, is very different. Um, and quite, um, I don't know if traumatizing, but it's, it's something that, that's very different. Driving, driving today, I, you know, in Israel, I'm used to getting rocket sirens. My phone keeps buzzing all the time. Here we drove, suddenly my phone started um, making noise that I did not recognize. And I, I lost the heartbeat, I'm telling you. I, I almost told Cornell here to stop the car. But it was a storm alert. So I, I guess you have different kinds of alerts here. But it was scary because I didn't know what, what, what to do. It said, seek shelter immediately. But, but it's rain, so, I, so I, I, I didn't understand. If we seek shelter in Romania from rain, we go to the bomb shelter or, or what? It wasn't clear, but um, so I, I have to say, I, I, yeah, it's, for, for me, it's amazing to be here with you because I said it's my first time here. And I, I wanna go quickly through um, some interesting information because I, served in the Israel Defense Forces for three years. In Israel, we have to serve, it's compulsory. I joined the Armored Corps in the tanks. The, and before joining the Armored Corps, I wanted to join a special unit to be in the commando in the Israel Defense Forces. So I worked, I ran, I, I worked out, I practiced. I went to the, the exam day for these elite units. And you know, it's funny, in the exams, we run dunes up and down, up and down. You carry people and you run. And always someone is in your ear telling you, you should give up. You should stop doing this. You should really give up. There's nice ice cream waiting down for you. There's cold water. Uh, and Sometimes it's spiritual, some, you know, that you're doing something and there's always someone, you should really stop doing what you're doing. Um, but it made me even more determined. Long story short, I did not get into a special unit. Um, but I really wanted to go into the Israeli Navy SEALs. When I didn't get accepted, I said, okay, if there is a war, I better do it not by walking, but on a vehicle because, you know, Less, less walking, less uh, spending uh, my, uh, training my muscles. And it paid off because during the Gaza war, I, uh, I was in the tanks. So we always had this joke among us soldiers that you have to walk, we are in the tanks, let me throw you some chips, some Snickers. Um, but something changed for me in the, in the army. And it's seeing how much Israel is hated. I, I was in the Gaza Strip in 2014. There is a war, like today, and we entered into the Gaza Strip, and they told us, you are not targeting Palestinian civilians. You are fighting Hamas terrorists. They told us this before we entered into the Gaza Strip. We hop onto the tanks, we enter into the Gaza Strip, 
And there is a very humane thought in, in my mind as we cross the border into Gaza and it's, am I going to come back alive or not? Because you're going to war. It's not a video game. And I, so I fought. I fought Hamas. Our mission was to target Hamas tunnels. And when I came out, first thing that you do when you come out of the Gaza Strip, you're Jewish, so you call your Jewish mother. And I call my mom and she sounds very calm. Now it's wartime. On TV, they, there are names of soldiers that, that, are, that are falling. There's fire, there's a, a lot of chaos. I call my mom after I come out of Gaza and I tell her, I'm out, how are you doing? And, and she sounds very relaxed. So I'm starting to worry that my mom doesn't like me because she's, she's too relaxed. And so I, I, I confronted her. I said, Mom, are you not worried about me? And she said, well, Hanani, I, I read in the Bible that the angels of God are with you. The angels of God are with you. Why do I need to worry? And I said, okay, this is a good excuse. Second thing, I opened my phone. And I see so many protests against Israel, like we are seeing today, burning the flag of Israel, calling me a war criminal. I knew what we were doing in Gaza. I knew the first day in the Israeli army, you are not getting a gun and they tell you, okay, you see someone that looks like an Arab, you shoot them. No. But this is what the media is telling people. The first day in the Israeli army, you get a small booklet that is called the IDF Code of Ethics. You first learn about human rights, how to behave like a human being, and only then you start to defend your country. So I saw what they're, saying, what they're showing the world and what we are actually doing, and I said, I have to do something. So I started to make videos about Israel, and I was very shy, so for me, it was very difficult to make the switch, but I said, if I don't do something, who is going to do this job? So long story short, I started to make videos about Israel. And uh, I, today, all together on, on the social media platforms, I have about uh, three million followers. But what really shook me is that there is hunger and thirst for people to hear about the truth. People are sick and tired of being lied to. It's crazy. When I started to grow on social media, I, I had a few hundreds of thousands of followers and, and, I, and I told myself, you know, I want to interview the Prime Minister of Israel. I want to interview Benjamin Netanyahu to hear how can we best defend Israel. And long story short, we made this interview happen. I wanted to ask him, Prime Minister, how can we best defend Israel? And he told me something very simple, but very shocking. He said, listen, we don't have to lie. We don't have to flip the story. Just tell the truth. Just tell the truth. So this is something that I, I started to, to do. Um, after this interview that I did, they, I get a phone call. They offer me to work for the prime minister. I was 22. When you're 22 and the prime minister offers you a job, you don't say no to this. Uh, so I still work for him and I help run the social media, not alone, but we are in charge of the social media platforms to make sure that the truth is coming out. Um, and especially in this war, we saw how important that is. We see today on social media so much hate just, just, yet, just in the past few days, there is this trend on social media, all eyes on Rafa. Rafa is a region inside the Gaza Strip. We operate there right now. The Israeli army is operating there. Anti-Israel people say all eyes are on Rafa right now. The whole world should look at what's going on in Rafa. 
Where was the world when 62,000 Christians were butchered in Nigeria? Where were their voices, eyes, when Syrian civilians were killed in the war, close to a million? All eyes on Rafa. All eyes should be on the truth. All eyes should be on the hostages. You know, because they, they, they're saying, all eyes are on Rafa, so help us find the hostages. We have a baby that is one year old. It celebrated its first birthday on planet Earth as a hostage, Kfir Bibas. We don't know if he's alive or, or not. And it's insane that we have this argument that we need to defend ourselves from the lies. I, I had this conversation with my wife on October 7. We hear the rocket sirens. She woke me up and she tells me, Hanania, we need to run to the bomb shelter. This was a real alarm, not, uh, not, not for rain. Not that I um, disrespect that. I, I know it can be dangerous, but we ran to the bomb shelter. And we saw all the videos that were coming. Hamas with GoPros filming how they shoot people that can be your grandmothers, sisters, brothers, shooting them, laughing, singing saying Allah Akbar while killing my brothers and sisters. I, I, I told my wife, you know, now the world is seeing this, at least now they will stand with Israel because they know what we are dealing with. The world stood with Israel for five minutes. And then when we started defending ourselves, they started attacking Israel. Now when we defend ourselves, they're attacking Israel, calling for ceasefire, saying that we commit uh, genocide, uh, apartheid, all kinds of accusations. Just look at these two pictures. Two families now under the ground. This one family, Bolstein, and this family, they were alive. They were alive before this war. Their crime is being Jews living in Israel. One, one uh, Romanian friend of mine, he told me, you know, Hanania, I, I think that if I was there on the border on that day, I'm not even Jewish, I'm not even Israeli, I'm Romanian. He tells me, they would probably kill me too. They wouldn't check your passport to know who are you. They will just kill you because you're not them. This, this is the essence of radicalism. They say, think like me or you should not be alive. So Israel's fight today is fighting this radicalism. They're saying that Israel is doing ethnic cleansing, kicking Palestinians out of Israel, out of their land. That's what they're saying. I, I, I like to look at the numbers. I'm, you know, they're very simple. In 1960, one million Palestinians. Today, over five million Palestinians exist. If we carry out ethnic cleansing, genocide, we're doing a very bad job because the number is going up, not down. They're saying uh, Gaza is the largest open prison on planet Earth because there is blockade. Israel blockades the Gaza Strip. What they are forgetting is that there is a, an, an Egyptian border also. That Egypt shares a border with Gaza as well. So if both Egypt and Israel are building walls, building a fence around the Gaza Strip, you, the question should be why both countries are building this. Maybe the problem is not Israel, but something in Gaza called Hamas. You know, because Egyptians are Arabs and they want nothing to do with the Gaza Strip. And it's because of Hamas. You know, second thing, I saw with my own eyes how Israel sends Gaza aid every day. Every day. They're saying that we use starvation as a weapon of war. Israel sends more aid than before the war. I saw it with my own eyes. Israel was filled with Palestinian patients in hospitals. 
before this war. I saw it with my own eyes in hospital of Hadassah in Jerusalem. Take a look at this. There are 31 countries with the symbol of cross in their flag. 21 with the symbol of Islam in their flags. Christian countries, Muslim countries, and there's only one country with the flag of Israel, the flag of Star of David, the symbol of the Jews. Is, is one too much? It's crazy that we need to explain ourselves to the, to the world. Why, why do we want to live in our homeland? Back then, they used to say, Jews, leave Europe. Go to Palestine. Jews, leave Europe. Go back to where you come from. Go to Palestine. Today, they're saying, Jews, leave Palestine. Go back to Europe. Guess what? We're home. We're not going anywhere. They will have to deal with that. We're not occupiers. We're the rightful owners. But you know, this raises a, a deep question of how nations are treating Israel, how nations are treating the Jewish people. We saw how Norway, Ireland, and Spain are taking action against Israel by uh, recognizing uh, Palestine as, as a state. And it's a problem from uh, the Israeli side because Hamas killed us, our, our families, and you reward them with a state? The Bible says, very famous Bible verse, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Through you, nations will be blessed. And now, it was written a long time ago. It, is this relevant? Some Christians are asking this. And, and they're saying, look, I love God. I love God. I, I pray. I, I go to church. I don't want to talk about Israel because it's political. Standing with Israel is not political, it's biblical. Because the Bible is filled with God's care and compassion for Israel. The word Israel appears in the Bible 2,507 times. It almost sounds like God cares about Israel, that Israel is important to God. So people that love God, should have love for Israel also because God does not change. And we, we, we're seeing proof of that. I want to show you examples. I want to show you examples. What happens when nations stood against Israel on the wrong side of history? Look at Venezuela, for example. Venezuela was one of the uh, first countries that recognized Israel. It voted in support of Israel in 1947. In 1950, it discovered a lot of oil, it, it became a wealthy country. Until a dictator came, Hugo Hafez, I think it was his name. He, his nickname was the anti-Israel dictator of Venezuela. Shortly after, poverty, crisis, Look what's going on there today. The, the, uh, Spain, in uh, the 1400s, there was the Jewish Inquisition. They kicked Jews out of there, out of Spain. Shortly after, the uh, Spanish world power went down. Soviet Union, there were uh, pogroms of Jews, killings of Jews, and what happened? So Soviet Union collapsed as well. But there is also an interesting example that I have to give you, and it's, and it's Germany. Jews suffered so much 
Jews were massacred by Nazi Germany with the influence of Nazi Germany. But something interesting happened in Germany, and it's called repentance. There is power in repentance. Germany repented. Germany today is one of the most pro-Israel countries in the EU, a very successful country. It has laws that ban pro-Hamas protests. They don't tolerate radicalism. They're very successful. And I believe it's because repentance is powerful. So when, when people come against Israel, when people want to kill me, they're not going after me, they're going after my God. Because my God, the God of Israel, stands with us. And it, I think it's very important to understand that we are not going anywhere. You know, people forget that Israel is a democracy. It's, it's a democracy where all cultures coexist. You know, 21% uh, of our population is Arab, with the majority of them uh, being Muslim. They have the same passport as I do. They enjoy the same rights. They can be doctors, police officers, uh, politicians. They can be in leadership positions. They can elect and get elected. So clearly, Israel is not the problem for Arabs. Two million of them live in Israel. Most people think that, you know, when, when people th hear the word Israel, that's what they think about. Soldiers running, something exploding. But I Israel has so much more to offer than conflict, wars, rumors of wars. Israel is a land of uh, success, a land of miracles. Israel was ranked after the war as the fourth happiest country in the world. I, I'm thinking to myself, what's going on here? What, how, how, how were we ranked the fourth happiest country in the world? Be if you visit Israel today, you will see something crazy happening. Th there's a lot of pain. I, I, I visited funerals where there was a friend of mine that he died in the war, he fell, and he was a hero. His friends were hit by an RPG. He saw that. He came out of his tank, ran to this tank to save them. As he was running, an RPG hit him as well. He sacrificed his life as he was running to save someone else's. I went to the um, funeral, you saw, uh, he was with me in the army. I see his mother crying, tears all over her shirt, and she's crying, bring me my son back. Bring me my son back. I, I didn't know how to react to that. I didn't know if, if I should hug her or um, I should say something to her. S there's so much pain, so much pain in Israel right now. Funeral after funeral. People don't have homes. People lost children. But still, Israelis are happy. And I tell this to my Israeli people. If we lose our smile, then the enemy won because we cannot let the enemy take away our joy. We have to continue living. We have to be strong. We have no other option. When, when I was deployed to defend Israel in the army, I said goodbye to my wife. I didn't know when, when is the next time I'm going to see her. But I, I knew one thing, and it's that I'm not defending the borders of Israel. I am defending my home and my family. Family is everything in Israel. 
Family is very important to us Israelis as it is to you guys. Because I saw with my own eyes what Hamas did. I traveled with the prime minister to the southern uh, area in Israel, to the massacre site. I visited kibbutzim there, villages. And I saw, I enter a home that is almost burnt, door is broken, bullets sprayed. I, I enter there, everything is on the floor, everything, blood. I, it was very, very, very graphic images. I, I, I will spare you the, the details, but I go to another home, same thing, baby um, carriage, that the baby is not there. You see bullets, and I, you try to imagine what was going on there. And, and it's the little things, it's the, it's the smell, it's the, um, the, the burnt homes. I saw what was going on there. So I knew that we have to be strong. We have to defend ourselves. You know, but like I said, there is so much more to the pain. And I want to encourage you also that you also be happy. Be happy and be uh, courageous as Romanians, as Christians. Um, we don't let the enemy take away our joy. And there we have a thousand reasons not to be happy. You know, Israel is where uh, people come to relax. And it's so beautiful. Before coming uh, to, to Norway and to Romania, I saw tourists coming back to Israel, walking in the streets of Jerusalem, dipping in the Dead Sea, because this is the Israel that I grew up in, a place of beautiful, where the Bible comes to life. You, you know, there, there is an argument. There is an argument uh, between uh, Christians. Where was Jesus buried and rose? Some say in the uh, tomb, the garden tomb, some say in the holy church of the sepulcher. So I said, you know what? I'm Israeli. Take my car. I drive to Jerusalem. Let's check the place. I took my car to the garden tomb. I checked the tomb. There is nothing there. I go to the holy church of the sepulcher. I look. The tomb is empty in both places. Jesus rose from the dead. This is what matters. The Jesus is up. It all happened in Jerusalem. The tombs are empty. The, this argument does not matter. What matters is that Jesus is alive. The, uh, Israel is the land where the Bible comes to life. Israel is the promised land, as, as it says in uh, this Bible verse. We are not occupiers. We didn't steal anything. And many times Christians say, you know, Christians that uh, don't like Israel nowadays, there are very few, but they're saying, God is a God of love. God is a God of grace. What I see on the news, this is not good. They forget one thing. What they're saying is true. But God is also a God of justice and a God of war. He says, I will fight for you. I will fight for you. So it's very important for you to also understand when you see protests calling to boycott Israel, saying free Palestine from the river to the sea. Have you noticed one thing? When they protest against Israel, there's never a sign calling for peace. There's never a sign saying, we, we accept you. It's always anti, anti, negative. When I defend Israel, when I speak with you, I'm not speaking because I hate Palestinians. I love Palestinians. I love Arabs. I speak with you because I love Israel, not because I hate. When people protest against Israel, 
they do it because they hate Israel, not because they love Palestinians. I was never taught to hate my neighbors. I believe in peace. So it's very important that you guys also take, take time to pray for Israel because we live in dark times. There is no middle. You have to know where you stand. And this war showed everyone this. It's a war between light and darkness. Evil and good. You know, I'll, I'll end with, with this. I, when the allied forces were fighting the Nazis, nobody said, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. Let's talk about it. Nobody protested. Nobody said, let's, let's make peace with them. Just imagine what the world would look like if, if, if it made peace with the Nazis. I would probably not be standing here and Jesus would probably not be welcome as well because he's Jewish. Just imagine, the world knew what evil is. When 9-11 occurred, no one said, we understand both sides. Nobody said, I understand you, America. I understand you, Al-Qaeda. People knew this is good and this is evil. Why in the case of my country, we're always hated, we always need to defend ourselves, we're always at war, I'm tired of wars. We don't want wars. I, I, I was in the war right now. I, I didn't wanna be there. I would much rather be with my family, watch a movie, eat dinner, but I understood that if I don't do this, there will be no, no Israel. Who is going to do, to do this for us? So I'm here not to come as a victim and not to make requests. I'm here to say thank you to you guys because you stand with Israel, and it's okay to have questions. It's great to have questions, but it's important that God sees your hearts, and I'm here to come from Israel to say thank you. Thank you for standing on the right side of history. God sees this. It doesn't matter if you're, uh, what kind of a Christian are you, strong, middle, weak. What matters is that this formula works. You stand with Israel, God stands with you. you. You stand against Israel, you stand against God. Bringing curse, we don't want that. So thank you guys very much for listening and we continue with the program. Thank you. Thank you, Hanania. I like what you said. You did not come here as a victim. Uh, and um, thank you very much for um, bringing up some um, things to think about. But hearing your uh, presentation, um, I feel compelled to ask you, you are the social media advisor for the prime minister. Uh, what went wrong there? Why or how come Israel kind of lost the PR war? Or at least the first, the first round of it? Mm. Well, it's, it's a question that we Israelis also have. Number one, how did it happen? How were they able to do this to us? And we still don't know. Uh, but I, I believe that Israel didn't take uh, this, didn't uh, notice because Hamas was preparing. Reports say that Israel uh, felt that Hamas is deterred, that Hamas does not want war based on the history that the past conflicts were only against Islamic Jihad and not Hamas, but Hamas was getting ready and was getting ready for something really bad and then the second phase is 
how are we losing the PR war? And the answer is very uh, simple. It's we are not the underdog. Israel is strong. It's very easy to look a victim. It's very easy when you are um, not strong, weaker than Israel, to show that you are a victim. And the, actually, it's very bad because Hamas is using civilians as human shields. Hamas does not care for civilians. This is why Israel sent soldiers into the Gaza Strip. The, you know, Israel could fought this war from above using only air force, only bombing Hamas buildings, but we don't want to target civilians. So we sent in soldiers, many of, of whom sacrificed their lives. Um, so it's a question that is in the back of many, many minds in Israel because people will always hate Israel no matter what we do, but there are people that will love Israel a lot and they're the middle, that just don't care or don't know enough about Israel. And them, I want to reach, to educate them. I don't want people to love Israel. This is not my intention, although I would really love for that to happen, but I want people to know what's happening and to make their own opinion because then it's on a solid rock. So their advantage is uh, victimization. We are a victim, so you uh, just play this uh, card with the wor world. Uh, and secondly is uh, this kind of uh, general um, misunderstanding of general rejection of, 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 of Jews uh, all over the world. It's so, so easy, just a few social media uh, uh, interventions and lots of people just buy the, uh, the thing it's, from them. It's very easy to, to do that. There is a term called Pallywood, Palestinian Hollywood. Hmm. It's all about being a victim. It's all about showing fake blood fake incidents. I'm not saying that incidents not, are not happening. It's mm -hmm. tragic when they happen. But Hamas is happy when it happens. Hamas, is, Hamas wants to show uh, its people as victims. It actually does not care when they die. Mm -hmm. It does not care for them. We, we saw in interviews that Hamas leaders, they said, we have the terror tunnels, under the ground, civilians will be above the ground. So they use children. They send their children into uh, summer camps where they learn how to shoot Jews. Uh, so, you know, throughout history, I had this uh, interesting conversation with a Holocaust survivor. He told me this, throughout history, empire after empire, enemy after enemy, tried to destroy the Jews. Mm -hmm. And here we are stand at the graveyard of our enemies, which shows that it's not good to mess with the God of Israel because we are here to stay. True. There are rumors that um, Hamas was um, funded and even uh, organized by Israel secretly. Was Hamas created by Israel? Who created Hamas and why? So this, this is also a whole... Um, fake news that people like to, anti-Israel activists like to share. Uh, the story is, again, it's, it's quite interesting because the story is that before uh, Hamas came to power, there was a lot of uh, chaos in the Gaza Strip. There were uh, individ individualistic attacks and there was one man that came, Ahmad Yassin, the founder of Hamas, he came to the uh, governor of Gaza back then, who was an Israeli, and he said, I will fix the problems for you if, uh, if only you build education centers and f you know, for children to, to not go into radicalism, for children to have um, schools, playgrounds, and he basically made Israel build uh, facilities for um, Palestinian civilians, and later we know the rest of the history that then Hamas came to power. It absolutely did not educate uh, or stop radicaliz uh, radicalism, 
On the contrary, it was even more uh, radical. But uh, basically, this equation that Israel created Hamas, it's That's not right. you. you it, it's, it's absurd because Hamas is not an organization. It's a radical ideology that stems from radical Islam. So what it means is basically that it says in their charter, Israel, uh, we have to destroy Israel and build an Islamic state on top of Israel. Why would Israel create something like that that uh, threatens our existence? We um, see that the problem is not with just Hamas, it's a radical ideology that had infiltrated Europe also. People that protest against Israel stand with Hamas that carry out genocide against Jews. You, you know what they say? They first come after the uh, Saturday people, the Jews. Secondly, after the Sunday people, the Christians. This is why we have to stand together against this. Is Hamas uh, worse than uh, other terrorist organizations in the Middle East? Uh, what's the point uh, in completely erasing Hamas with the risk of killing, let's say, too many civilians, while there are many other terrorist organizations that hate Israel? So, destroying Hamas does not mean to go after every terrorist until it reaches zero. Mm -hmm. Because, as I've said, it's a radical ideology. When America was fighting ISIS, they didn't wait, they, they didn't kill until the uh, last number of ISIS uh, terrorists. But what you do is you fight the uh, center idea, the, those that head, that lead this idea, until you reach a point that uh, this, this ideology dissolves. Um, but of course, it's a big challenge because it's not, it, it's not a, it, it's not a, you can't limit radical ideology to a right. border. And th this is why it's a, it's a propaganda war that we see that many, many people fall into Hamas propaganda, believing that they are freedom fighters and that this is resistance. And then Europe rewards this with statehood. So it's a big problem mm -hmm. that is not just Israel's. Thank you. Well, coming to your response to the Hamas uh, uh, war now, is Israel's response in Gaza disproportionate compared to Hamas' October 7th attacks? This thing, this idea, this kind of uh, thinking uh, is pretty common lately. Um, so is the response disproportionate? By casualties, it seems so, even by the ones reported by Israel government. Of course, we're not comparing with the data you showed us, uh, but taking this incident, the Gaza war, uh, the October 7th, 1,200 people died, uh, Israeli um, uh, Jews, and now, according to who you, do you listen, there are tens of thousands. So, there, there was a journalist that had the, the perfect response to proportionalism, mm -hmm. and he said it very simply. I, I, I will repeat what he said. He said, if you want a proportionate response by Israel, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. So do you mean that we should go into Gaza, rape the exact number of women that Hamas raped, decapitate, cut heads mm -hmm. of the same people that Hamas cut, and uh, shoot exactly in the way that Hamas shot in the head, in the neck, put in the oven, the exact number of babies that Hamas put, is this the proportionate that uh, you're talking about? It's absurd. absurd. But I will tell you also this. I carry with, with me a necklace um, that I got from a member of Zaka. Zaka is people that uh, collect bodies. They were collecting bodies on October 7. And I'll tell you why it's related to proportionism because he, was, he gave me this necklace um, and he said, I want you to remember uh, my story by, by wearing this necklace in um, support of the hostages. He said, we were there in the music festival collecting hundreds of bodies of Jewish uh, Israelis who came to dance. I, he, he tells me, I saw things uh, I wish my eyes could not see. 
But I have to tell you something else. We saw Hamas bodies also of terrorists. And he said, we picked them up also. We treated them also. Because we, the Jews, we are not like them. We have human rights that runs in our blood. He said, with the same terrorists that murdered my nation, my people, we picked them up. So war is bad. War is not something that uh, anyone should want. We don't want war. We didn't have war on October 6. We did not start this war. But one thing is for sure, that we will finish the war. And finishing the war means finishing Hamas. We cannot allow another October 7 to happen. Imagine you have neighbors that killed your neighbor and they tell you, we will kill you also, you are next. Wouldn't you want an army to stop them? <laughs> Wouldn't you, would you want to continue living there? You would, if you knew that this threat is no longer there. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, again, from your presentation, I have another question. Why aren't the Palestinians absorbed by other Muslim countries? Why nobody else wants them? Like Egyptians, they don't want them there. Jordanians, they have about 2 million Palestinians in, in their country since the 60s, the Seven Days War or something like that. Uh, we visited Jordan uh, last year. Um, I, uh, we understood while visiting the, the Jordan, we understood that Palestinians are kind of uh, kept away from police, government, for some reasons. Why? It's a great question. Why Palestinians are not welcome in other Arab countries? It's a absolutely great question. Um, so, in my opinion, Jordan is Palestine because Jordan has three million Palestinians, okay. and the Queen of Jordan is Palestinian. Jordan, uh, the British mandate over uh, uh, Palestine, what they said, the majority of it is Jordan. Um, the little of it was supposed to be the Jewish state. Um, there is a, a reality for Palestinians outside of Israel that the media does not talk about. Did you know that there is a Palestinian uh, camp, village, in Lebanon, that the Lebanese government surrounded by a wall? They, there is apartheid against Palestinians in Lebanon Palestinians in Syria were shot dead by the Assad regime. That does not seem to grab the attention of the media, only when it comes to Israel. So they don't talk about it because they cannot blame Israel. But the, the, um, and, the and this is a deeper level, but Palestine, Palestinian, what does it mean? This group of people, first of all, Palestine, is not the Philistines in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Philistines in the Bible, they originally come from Greek islands, but the meaning of it, Philistine, is invader. So, you call yourself invaders of Israel. Okay, uh, that's a very interesting name. I'm willing to respect that, but I demand the respect back because there is no such nation as Palestine, as Palestinian. It's group of Arabs that came from neighboring countries and resided in Israel. So, and you can prove that based on family names. Al-Misri from Egypt, Mitzrayim, all kinds of family names. It's groups of Arabs that came from neighboring countries into Israel and now they want to call themselves Palestinians. Although their origins stem from Egypt, Jordan, uh, other countries. I'm willing to respect them. I, I will demand the respect back. And you know, the, the problem is that uh, I tell, I had a conversation, uh, I was in Oslo just before coming here, and I saw a pro-Palestine protest, encampment, what they say, in front of the parliament. And I said, I'm here, let's have fun. So I, I came to them and I, I, 
I'm going to post the video, but I, I also I asked them, I will, I told, because they said, you are occupier. You don't belong in Israel. Look at how you look. Look at how you look. Look at how I look. I said, it, first of all, is, isn't that racist? I, I thought we're in a world of uh, mm -hmm. um, calling this stuff out. But I said, I will pack my bag. I will leave Israel, okay? I will, I will pack my bag and go somewhere. If you just show me who was the Palestinian king, who was the Palestinian king? I know a King David. I don't know of a Palestinian king. Show me your history in this land before the age of television. I'm willing to respect you living here, but if you don't respect me, we're, you're gonna have these arguments. But the question should not be uh, who was here first, who is more a victim. The question should be how can we move forward? They live here, we live here, we need to find some sort of a solution. This should be the question. Because if they want to argue who was here first, we're going to win this argument very quickly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But still, why? Well, I mean, there is plenty of space in Egypt for Palestinians to go if they want. And I understand there are Palestinians that would like to run and live in Egypt. They don't receive them. I'm sure there are Palestinians from Gaza that would like to go in Jordan and they don't receive them. Is they don't want them. They don't want them, yeah. It's something again. Uh, what is uh, pushing them not to accept them? The, this is an interesting Economically question. Economically or something else? I, I, I th clear, clearly, this is a fact that they don't want them. But then you have to look at how Arabs are in the Gulf, for instance. Mm -hmm. They're progressive, moving forward. Mm -hmm. They're 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 very successful. They're not thinking about uh, how victims they are or how bad their lives are. They build their lives. And I think that this is something that is in our J uh, Jewish DNA also, because we could be victims until, until we, we die. We could be victims when we wake up and when we go to bed. But we choose not to be victims. We choose to build ourselves. And look what Israel did in 76 years. Israel built itself, became a very strong country, superpower. I think that perhaps the answer lies there. Some people choose to be victims and some people choose to live their lives, build their future. And you don't necessarily want that kind of people in your country to... This is a question that perhaps Arab leaders could have the best answer for that. But I think that, um, you know, we lived, I lived in Samaria, the heartland of Israel. And my parents would take me to do shopping in Jenin. It's a Palestinian city mm -hmm. before the Intifada before they tried again to kill us and failed, we would go there to shopping. And my, f you know, my father noticed this thing that they don't care for their city. They don't care for anything. So he asked one of his friends, why is your city like this? And his Arab friend told him, people live here like they are temporary, like they... Um, like they don't care. And we saw that when Hamas sent incendiary balloons, balloons with fire, mm -hmm. into Israel to burn farmland. <laughs> if, you, if, if you say that the land is yours, why do you burn it? Yes, thank you. I, I understood exactly what you wanted to say. Thank you. Well, let's move a little bit towards the Israeli or Jewish uh, world community. There are some questions in, in our minds. We see, um, for example, the anti-Zionist Jews. What's going on there? Like you mentioned something about your divided society, uh, and when I hear 
Jews uh, against the Jews and Jews uh, in America, for example, just uh, demonstrating alongside the Palestinians against yeah. what's happening in Israel. I'm like, what's going on there? There, there is a group of Jews called Neturei Karta that they are, like you said, always the first ones to burn the flag of Israel, always the first ones to protest against Israel. It's biblical. Because I'll tell you why, throughout Bible, we always saw uh, Jews that were coming against other Jews when the Israelites came out of Egypt also. Mm -hmm. Self-hating Jews. Now, what the media does very beautifully is try to pr present these group of Jews as majority. They are about 800 families. Very small sect, radical sect that even Orthodox Jews don't accept. Um, now the question is why? Why? Why are the why are these Jews stand with uh, the Iranian regime, for example? Because the Iranian regime essentially wants wants to erase the Jewish state of Israel. Now, it's it's very interesting how it comes together because it's they're together for the wrong reasons that somehow become one reason. The Netuei Karta Jews, these that burn the flag of Israel, they do that not because they hate, um, I'll explain to you. They believe that the Messiah will come and only then we will build Israel. So to them, the existence of Israel postpones the coming of the Messiah. This is why they come against Israel. The enemies of Israel just want to erase Israel. So they have the same mission but for the wrong reasons because they say the Messiah will come when Israel will not be and then we will build Israel but they say we will destroy Israel and build an Islamic uh, autonomy on top of that. Uh, so the bottom line is that uh, it's not something that's, that's, that's uh, surprising. We have seen this in biblical times, self-hating Jews and it's very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, alongside um, the same uh, the same lines, um, Haredi population in Israel. Uh, I see all this struggle uh, in the society with the, um, forcing them to do the IDF service to go into the military. Uh, I see all this dialogue uh, against. I see rabbis that say, "Hey." Their mission is to pray, not to fight. But then I see lots of uh, young uh, soldiers that die there. For so, what's going on with with them? Uh, it's a bit strange for for me to see that a very ultra orthodox, uh, very yeah. strong believers in Judaism, they don't want to fight uh, physically for their country. Well, I served for three years in the Israel Defense Forces. Serving in the army means you stop your life, mm -hmm. you pause your dreams, your goals, and you dedicate yourself for three years to serve your country. I don't care what uh, people say, I don't care what, if it's popular to say that or not, but I think that everyone who lives in Israel must contribute to the mm -hmm. state of Israel, True. period. Mm -hmm. If you live here, you need to contribute to Israel, because we are, we're, we're always in survival mode. Mm -hmm. So we can't allow ourselves uh, to let go of our guards. And there are many ways you can contribute to Israel. Many, many people join um, Zaka, like the guy that, the Haredi guy that gave me this necklace that was helping pick up remains of, of after the massacre. People uh, contribute to uh, driving ambulances. There are many ways people can contribute. And I don't accept when people say that they don't want to contribute to Israel and that they would rather go to prison than to uh, contribute to Israel. This is a spit in my face because I served Israel. And so will my children, just like uh, everybody else's children. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And why do they refuse to do that? Well, 
I have to say it doesn't represent the majority of, of Haredim because I, okay. th there are many, many amazing Orthodox Jewish uh, men and women that uh, give food to the, to the poor mm -hmm. uh, and they don't even want to, to be on, on camera. They don't want to talk about it. They do it in secret. There are many amazing people that contribute to society. Uh, but like we said, there is always a, a radical minority that makes so much noise, like the ra radical minority that um, stands against Israel, Netoi Karta. And I have an Orthodox Jewish friend that tells me, we don't like them in our society. We don't like them. And th there is a trend now to encourage Orthodox Jews to join the Israeli army or to contribute in their own ways. There are many ways to contribute. And, uh, you know, we, we live in a country where there is always something you can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess the same answer would be for the um, a small part of the Haredi population that's spitting on non-Jews. We see all those, uh, we watch all those uh, videos, and I myself was, uh, I was in such a situation in, in Jerusalem. It's pretty shocking, and yeah. yeah, I guess we would like to understand what's going on in their mind, if you can tell us, if not, I understand, but it's so strange. You go and ask somebody, how do you get to the temple, the, the exhibition there, and they spit, well, not on you, but in front of you, and yeah. it's like, What's this kind of treatment? What's in their mind? Or in their religion or whatever? I, I could avoid the question and I could tell you I don't want to answer that. But I believe in telling the truth even when it's not beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it's true that these things happen. And it breaks my heart because I, I feel what people in your shoes feel. Mm -hmm. There are radical people that think that um, I, I try to understand what's, what's going on in their head when they do that, but they basically uh, really hate Christians. But the thing is that uh, then the media is also using this to make mm -hmm. Israel look like it hates Christians. This is not true. These are individuals. Someone in Romania can, can spit on me. Does it mean that Romania is anti-Semitic? No individuals that take the law into their own hands, when they do that, they are arrested, they're put in jail, okay. sometimes in prison, okay. because this is a crime. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that this is an individual, radical individuals that are doing that, but still it doesn't matter when it happens, I condemn this. What I'm shocked, however, is that some, when I condemn this, there are even people that condemn me for condemning this. And it really shows you the intense relationship that, that uh, still exists between uh, Jews and, and Christians. But the beautiful thing is that most Jews and most Christians stand united. We still need to build this bridge, the bridge of unity between Jews and Christians. So th this is why I, I like to speak with Christians to, you know, the bridge already exists, but we, we can all help make it stronger. And at the end of the day, many people that don't like Christians, they never spoke to a Christian. They don't know uh, who, the, who the Christians are. So I also encourage Jews to learn more. Many Christians come to Israel, they don't want to convert Jews to Christianity. I, I, I oppose that. They come to Israel to learn, to come alive, to let the Bible, to, to come to the land of the Bible. They contribute to the Israeli economy. They come to pray for Israel. They are a blessing to Israel. We cannot allow ourselves to disrespect them. They are the best friends we have. Also in the time of the Holocaust, many Christians saved Jews, took Jews in and hid them. I, I visited the home of Cory ten Boom mm -hmm. in Holland, in the Netherlands. Their family risked their lives to save Jews. Uh, our our uh, relationship goes back in history and we exist today to make sure that it goes forth into the future.
Thank you for answering to, to this question. It, it really helps to know that it's not, it's not something common. It's a very it's not common. small number of people. We have our extremists too, that's, that's true. And uh, to hear that it's also punishable by law, again, uh, tells something about the, the general view on, on that. Okay, um, we have some other questions also. Is the rise of anti-Semitism around the world fueling the return of the Jews to the Holy Land? Do you see that happening? I read lots of articles about that. Uh, Jews from all over the world trying to mobilize themselves to come to the land. Uh, it's, it's happening. It, I, I myself wrote an, an article about how I think we should have a plan in the Negev desert to accommodate uh, millions of Jews that uh, you know can potentially come to Israel and there are many Jews that are scared for their lives we are the maybe the only people on the in the world that when we go somewhere out of our country we are advised to hide who we are when I travel to Europe EU it's 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 like the West I'm advised to hide that I'm Jewish to hide that I'm Israeli. Hmm. No peoples have to do that. Uh, so there is rise in anti-Semitism yes. and it's, it's very unfortunate. So it, it really shows that, you know, God loves Israel. God does not change. Everything that God loves, Satan hates. It's, it's basic. Therefore, anti-Semitism is Satanism because Everything that God loves, Satan hates. So Jews must be safe. It's very sad that they don't feel safe in their countries. Um, but I, I am happy that there are people like, like you that make Jews feel at home. Because it's not just uh, in, in Romania. You, in the world of social media, global media, you make Jews feel at home on social media um, by not being silent when you see something. When I see a Christian attacked, I'm not silent because it's a human being. It's a human being that, that what matters here. That's, that's also when it comes to Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Israeli lives matter, Palestinian lives matter. We're all human beings. Two more questions before uh, going to the questions from, uh, from the audience. And those two questions will uh, try to move our um, um, mind perspective to in the future. Uh, well, we read in Ezekiel 39, in Revelation 16, Revelation 20, about end of times, about uh, Gog and Magog, about Armageddon, um, about the country of uh, Meshech, Tubal, and so on. Some names that are kind of strange for us, uh, of course, we can find on the internet where are they located and so on. Um, talking in, in, in modern, uh, uh, using modern names, what do you think about Iran, Russia, China, North Korea? They are, during these times, they are kind of getting together, kind of trying to build some alliances. They already help each other in the, in the war in Ukraine and uh, I guess maybe less seen but in, in uh, around Israel too. Do you think uh, or what to, to expect in the future regarding the world's political scene? Are those countries uh, the ones that are mentioned in Ezekiel 39? Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to speculate which country is it yeah. going to be, which leader um, I, and, and there are many uh, fear mongers, mm -hmm. war mongers, which means people that want to, that, you know, that know what is going to happen tomorrow. No one knows what is going to happen uh, tomorrow. Right. We, it's, it's, it's a miracle when you wake up and you see the sun. And, it, you know, I, I think that, of, of course, according to the Bible, whoever does not stand with Israel stands against uh, on, on, on in darkness. And 
it's not a, a good thing to be in darkness. Uh, but it's interesting to see the, the geopolitics because fun fact, October 7 is, is also Putin's birthday. Um, there is a war happening right now between Russia and, and Ukraine. And after Israel and Gaza are at war, the media attention shifted from Ukraine to Israel. And that definitely plays to the advantage of Putin because the world talks less about what he's doing. But I think that what's important is to uh, focus on what we have and, and what we know. We know that Israel is under attack and we know that uh, forces will come against Israel. But the most important thing is that we know how this story is going to end. Mm -hmm. And we want to be on the right side of history because as we see, uh, you know, standing against God brings curse to your life. And I, I, I wanna quickly say, you know, it's, it's really amazing because I, I was in Hungary. My first talk was in Hungary and I, this family hosted me and I didn't know them very well. It, it, now that I think about it, maybe I should have checked before I come, but we just texted on, on Facebook. We are, we're amazing friends right now, but we texted on social media and they invited me to Hungary. So I said, I'm coming. And they hosted me, I spoke there and I left not knowing you know, their struggles, their, their deep stories. Then I get a text from, from, from my friend and he tells me, you know, Hanania, we have been praying for seven years for a baby. We cannot have children. We were trying to adopt a baby and we could not find a baby, bureaucracy, all the doors were closed. You came, we hosted you and you left Week after something like that, doors open, God gave us the baby. I'm, it's not because I, I, I came. This is not uh, the, the story. It's because they blessed Israel. They're, they opened their uh, doors to bless Israel. And so it really shows that this formula works, uh, that standing with Israel is bringing blessing to your way. Um, so I just found it really amazing that that now I went to there again and I met their uh, child, Peter, his name. And it's really amazing that what we read in the Bible is really relevant in our times. Also in the book of Zechariah, it says, nations will come against Israel. We see it happening today. In verse three, it says what is happening to those nations. It's not good news for those nations. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we'll take some uh, uh, questions from the audience and uh, here are some of them. Um, well, before that, I, I like the way, uh, the way you, you, and, uh, you, you answered to the last question. Um, actually, we should take very seriously what God says in Genesis and Deuteronomy, the verses you showed us. Uh, because those are, hmm. it's a simple and direct way to just to obey God and take him uh, by his word. Yeah. Okay, some questions from the audience. What is your take on Palestine being recognized as a state by Norway, by, by Norway Ireland and Spain? What will uh, the consequences of this be? So I, I came here from Norway and I was actually shocked to, be, to experience so much love from Norwegian people. So it really is amazing to see that the government of Norway does not represent the people in Norway. Exactly. Every other person I spoke with said we are praying that the election that we have, we will change this government. So they don't like this decision but I think as an Israeli that uh, it does not change the situation for Israel because uh, you know they can recognize whatever they want. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't change the reality, but it's declaration. Exactly. And when you do declaration, it, it, it's very, very dangerous, especially if it's against God. 
we talked about the physical war and the spiritual war. This is a declaration in the spiritual war, I believe. And it's, uh, so I, I said, it's not good for Norway, it's not good for Spain, and it's not good for Ireland. But, not to make a, compar a comparison, but in, in uh, Genesis, there is the story of uh, Lot and Abraham. How, how God uh, said, you know, I will save Sodom if you bring me 10,000 people that are righteous. He, he couldn't find 10,000. So he said, you know what? He was begging, he said, 5,000, 1,000, 100. I think it went to 10. It means that God has mercy and has grace that he does not want to destroy, he does not want to curse. But, you know, in the spiritual warfare, it's, it's a, every action has consequences. What you do has a, has a, a blessing or, or a curse. Mm -hmm. And it's biblical. Right. How great is the fear of escalation into a multiple front war with Hamas in the south, Hezbollah in the north, and possible involvement from Iran? Th this is an interesting one, and it hits home to me because I'm from the Galilee. I was born and raised in the Galilee, and I remember in the second Lebanon war, 2006, we had rocket sirens, and I, as a child, I didn't understand why, why do they hate us? What is their problem with us? And I wanted to, to fight back. I wanted to do something. Today, Hezbollah uh, caused to the reality that there are tens of thousands of Israelis evacuated from their city. Kiryat Shmona, there, there are several villages and towns that are ghost towns. They, these families don't live there in their homes because uh, of the war. And first of all, it's very bad. Hezbollah has an arsenal estimated to be 150,000 rockets, precision guided uh, missiles that can hit many, many places in Israel. Uh, there is a map for that. And, but the worst thing that can happen to Hezbollah happened to Hezbollah. And it's very interesting. Hezbollah has one boss called the Islamic regime in Iran that they want to destroy Israel. They want to destroy Israel. But Hezbollah also became a political party. So Hezbollah is a terrorist organization that also be entered politics and now it has a second boss, Lebanese people. Hezbollah is, a, is also in the, in the, or was represented, still is, I didn't check, the, in the parliament in Lebanon. So they're in politics on top of being terrorists. So one boss wants to destroy Israel. The second boss knows that war is gonna lead to very bad news for uh, them. They don't want war. So what we see today is that Hezbollah is trying to satisfy the two bosses. So it says I will, they will, they're launching as many rockets as they can without officially starting a war. They're launching, they, they're doing as much as they can, but keeping the, um, the, 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 the war uh, not, not focused there. Um, so I think that Hezbollah does not want war uh, with Israel because they know that it is going to lead to their end and to massive destruction. We see the destruction that uh, Hamas brought to Gaza by launching war against Israel. Um, but at the same time, my Israeli heart is saying we, we, it doesn't matter because I have friends that don't live in their homes because they're launching as many rockets as they can without starting a war. It, it, it's a problem that should be countered. And the defense minister in Israel, he uh, instructed soldiers recently, uh, be ready. We are getting ready for, for, um, for reaction. So it's going to be very um, dramatic uh, days in, in terms of uh, what is happening because the enemies of Israel keep trying to destroy Israel and Hezbollah deep inside, of course, does, want, does not want Israel to exist. But keep in mind that Hezbollah and Hamas, they are not the same. Hamas is Sunni Islam. Hezbollah is Shia Islam, and they hate each other. Sunni and Shia, they hate each other. Um, so 
I remind myself that, you know, God is watching uh, Israel and he does not sleep nor slumber. Mm -hmm. Right. Can you explain the truth about Napka? Wikipedia describes it at, as an ethnic cleansing of the um, Palestinians. On social media, they accuse Israel of it. So, the, the, when Israel celebrates Independence Day, uh, Palestinians in Gaza and uh, such places celebrate Nakba. Not, not celebrating, they march and they say that Israel stole the land and, and kicked them out of there. And um, it's the real ethnic cleansing is of Jews from Arab countries. I, li I, I like to point to that, that Jews used to live in the tens of thousands, even hundred thousands in countries, in Arab countries in the Middle East. Today, there are very few left. The, in, in Egypt, it, it's less than 10. It's, this is the real ethnic cleansing. The Jews were, drived, were driven out of Arab countries because they're Jews, were kicked out of their land, were kicked out of their homes because they're Jews, their belongings were stolen from them. This is the ethnic cleansing. About 850,000, close to 1 million Jews were driven out of their uh, homes. And so they're saying when they mark Nakba, they're saying Israel is the problem and without Israel, we will have peace. If Israel did not exist, Jews and Arabs would live in peace. This is one big lie. Israel today is just an excuse for them to hate Jews. They're saying, I'm not anti-Israel, uh, I'm, I'm only anti-Zionist. I, I don't hate Jews, I only hate Zionists. You can't hate the Jews and love uh, Israel in the same way you can't uh, hate uh, Israel and love the Jews. Israel is the Jewish nation. Um, so it's important to remember the Hebron massacre in 1929, years before the reestablishment of Israel, Arabs massacred Jews in 1929 in Hebron because they are Jews. Israel was not in the picture. Israel was not recreated so it really shows that their problem is with Jews living in their ancestral homeland. It's not about Israel. It's just another excuse. Mm -hmm. Are there any serious threats towards Israel from other countries that could start a greater war? Uh, th this is an interesting uh, question. I, I think that um, Israel has uh, enough fronts we are not, uh, yeah, it's, we, I think, have um, the defense minister said seven uh, different fronts. So countries that also don't border with Israel want to destroy Israel. Um, but, you know, in the Middle East, there, there is a group of people that know what Israel is going through. And it's called the Iranian people. Iranian people support Israel. They have a burning heart for Israel. And... It's not because they're uh, Christians. Many of them are uh, atheists, uh, Muslims. But the thing is that they uh, understand what is the true color of radical Islam. They live it. They suffer from it. The Islamic regime kills their people and they know what Israel is going through. That's why Iranian people know they've, in the best way what Israel is dealing with. Mm -hmm. Can you see an end to the conflict? What is the most probable peace solution or end of conflict in your opinion? Wow. Um, well, they say um, seven more months maybe, but you know. Yeah, the, there are e estimates, estimates that maybe this war will end in a few months. Others say that it will take years. Um, you, you know, it's. I think that the key to solve the conflict, it's not land, it's education. Because you don't give land for peace. You give peace for peace. This is how it should work. We tried giving land for peace in 2005 and it did not work. You give peace for peace. And I think that we will have peace when the, the easy way is when the Prince of Peace will come. And then we will have peace. But the, until then, we need to change the education. 
you have children that mothers send their children to kindergarten and they teach them that Israel should not exist, that uh, we are monsters, they train to kill Jews in summer camps, as I've mentioned. So education is the key. When they will learn that we are not going anywhere and that we are here to stay, then we will, of course, have peace. And, you know, at the end of the day, people like to talk about conflict that, that Israel has because it, it attracts attention. Um, I, I like to think about what unites people. Everybody agrees on food. Everybody agrees on culture. And everybody agrees on music. I think that when we try to agree on things and not to try uh, to think what we, how are we divided, uh, th this, this will be a step closer to getting peace. My wife has this one sentence. She's a journalist in Israel. And she says, you attract more, uh, there's this phrase, you attract more flies with honey than vinegar. So when you show positivity, it attracts more than, than when you talk about negativity. I think she's right. <laughs> uh, two more questions. Uh, what is the difference between Arabs in Israel and Arabs in Gaza? How Israeli Arabs can have a good life in Israel, but the Arabs in Gaza can't be part of Israel? How, how is one? So, how um, Israeli Arabs can have a good life in Israel, but the Arabs in Gaza can't be part of Israel? That's a, that's a good question. After October 7, there was a, a poll, a survey that was conducted that showed that Israeli Arabs sympathize with Israel more than ever before. Another survey showed that Israeli Arabs would not trade their passport, their citizenship, for anything else. They love being Israelis because they, they enjoy the best lives as Arabs in the Middle East. Arabs kill each other in neighboring countries, in Syria and in Lebanon and in Gaza also. In Israel, they thrive. Uh, now, Arabs in, in Gaza, they uh, don't have Israeli passport. They have Jordanian passport also in Judea and Samaria. Uh, they, they are not Israelis. Um, and that, that is something that is very interesting to see that while Israeli Arabs, they sympathize with Israel, uh, Palestinians, Arabs who are not Israelis, they uh, sympathize with Hamas and they want they support another massacre like this. Uh, I think Reuters showed that there was a survey that 72% um, of Arabs in Judea and Samaria, who are not Israelis, support Hamas. How can they be part of, of Israel if they don't want to see Israel? Um, but secondly, it's, it's, it's something that we have to uh, keep in mind that Israel is a blessing to Palestinians also. We welcome them into our hospitals. We provide them with jobs. And, um, you know, so I, I do believe in, in peace. I do want to see, um, you know, less conflicts. It's something that we don't want to see. But I, I will tell you about a conversation I had with a Palestinian from Gaza. He converted to Judaism. He was a Muslim. And I asked him, what is their problem with us? What do they want from us? the Palestinians, and he told me, Hanania, even if we give them Jerusalem, you want Jerusalem, take Jerusalem. You want Israel, take Israel. He tells me, even if you go to Europe, they will chase you down to Europe and they will kill you there because their problem is not with Israel, their problem is with the Jews. He says, this is a religious war, it's not a territorial war. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, last question. How can a Romanian bless Israel during pre present history? Can you give us some practical examples? How can be, yeah. us Romanians be with you, alongside you? Well, this is the most voted question. The most voted. Well, uh, first of all, I'm it's amazing that you guys are, are listening um, and 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I have to come back to Romania. You're um, welcome. And, but I, I have to say, first of all, that it's, it's amazing to be here. Also, blessing, um, be, because I'm here to, to bless Romania by building a bridge between Israel, to, Israel and Romania um, with the glory to God. But uh, practically saying, you, there is prayer. That, that people are doing, but and, and there is there is um, okay. Uh, join a community, uh, post positively on social media. But I, you know, I think that what's most important is to build friendships. This is why I come here to build friendships because I think that this is how Romanians can best bless Israel by being a friend to Israel, not a, not the nation, but find a person. Find someone. I would love to uh, make friends. This is why I come here, to make friends. Because next time something happens in Israel or in Romania, I don't think about the, uh, the country, Romania. I think about my friend, that he's there. So I think this is the best way that someone can bless and stand with Israel. To not be silent, um, because we know what happened in history when people were silent. But I would also say that, you know, it's... Each one of us has a passion. Each one of us is good at something. And this is why it's amazing to be able to use the, the uh, passion, the talent that you have to do something good. Um, and you know, on that note, I, I do have to say that it's, it's amazing that, um, you know, what, what also Heartbeats uh, Festival they're doing. Because when in many places that I travel, I don't see young people. And I'm asking myself, myself what the world is going to look like in terms of Israel uh, 30 years from now or, or, or a relationship with God 30 years from now. We need the young people. So I, I think that it's amazing also what uh, you are doing, Heartbeats uh, doing to make sure that the young people are rich and that the young people know what's going on um, because I think that this is also something that Romanians would relate to. Um, you know, Romania throughout history was treated uh, badly in some cases. In the Soviet Union, uh, Romanians were treated like a second class and also in, in other uh, cases, Romanians now after coming out of the Soviet Union, uh, some Romanians feel like the EU looks down upon Romania like second class. We Jews have uh, we know very well what does it mean to feel second class. We have been, we have been through that uh, second class in wherever we have been uh, attacked, under pogroms, hated, called to boycott as, us. Um, but the thing is that we have something in common and is that we don't look at ourselves as victims but as ones that build the future, that come out of whatever we've been through to go far in the future. So I believe that if you as Romanian want to bless Israel, bless the Jewish people, um, more than praying and more than visiting Israel, it's to be vocal and to make, make a friend. Um, and yeah, stay informed. Thank you very much, Hanania. Uh, you, the time with you was very instructive and yes, uh, we would like to invite you back sometime. Uh, I would love that. Așa că mulțumim frumos. Mulțumim și fratelui Boingeanu care l-a adus în coace. Am fost întrebat de mulți cum l-ai găsit, pentru că cum am zis, unul știți de multă vreme și îl urmăriți pe internet. Cum l-am găsit? Zic, nu l-am găsit eu, el ne-a găsit pe noi. Și vă mulțumim mult că ați dat un telefon și ne a spus de prezența lui aici. În concluzie, Israelul este aici în istorie ca să stea. Absolut nimic. Indiferent de forțele împotriva lui, indiferent de perioadele de persecuție îndelungate, Israelul a rămas și va rămâne. Uh, și raportarea noastră la Israel 
contează. Este scris, este acolo, uh, Israelul este în planul lui Dumnezeu, că ne place, că nu ne place. Uh, așa că să plecăm de aici cu o inimă deschisă și să luăm în considerare ce spune Dumnezeu și să nu ne pomenim că întoarcem spatele planului Lui. Vă mulțumim că ați fost cu noi la ediția asta de Flux.